some music. Welcome social media. There we are. Let's let everybody in. Evening. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. Good evening. This is uh, Greatest Generation Live, our Masters of the Air series for Thursday, March 21st. The Veterans Breakfast Club. My name is Sean Hall. I'm the Director of Programming with the VBC. With me, as always, is Glenn Flickinger. Glenn, how are you doing? Excellent. Doing well tonight, Sean. Thank you. Wonderful. It's great to see you all here again for another episode of Masters of the Air. I was just telling Glenn in the green room uh, that I finished up the series and loved it. I loved every minute of it. The only critique I think I might have is that those final two episodes kind of flash forward a little too quick for me. Uh, we were saying maybe they ran out of money. Maybe they just needed to, to wrap up the stories. Who knows? Uh, maybe we'll get uh, some answers as we continue on with our series of Masters of the Air. And we have some of the uh, people that were producing and writing and directing uh, Masters of the Air on. Um, but uh, other than that, they did just a fantastic job. Uh, really, really wonderful. I see Ed Cottrell in the room. Ed, it's great to see you. Doug Dwar, it's great to see you as well. Um, we always Dave Seaver. Uh, it's a, a lively, good bunch tonight. Um, well, I'm going to hand it off to Glenn here in just a second. But first and foremost, I just want to say thank you all for joining us here. Uh, we've been creating this community of listening around veterans and their stories uh, since 2008. And the programs we share connect, heal, educate, and inspire. And they are only made possible with your generous support. You can donate to the Veterans Breakfast Club and become a member by visiting our website, www.veteransbreakfastclub.org. Not only that, on there, you can sign up for our weekly e-blast. You can check out our blog. You can view past uh, interviews that we've done with veterans through our Veterans History Project. You can check out our previous Scuttlebutt podcast uh, previous episodes online. There is a ton of stuff you can do on our website, not only just uh, becoming a member and donating to this great mission that we serve and love, um, but uh, we'll get to our sponsors a little later, Tobacco Free Adagio Health and For Life. We want to thank them for sponsoring this program. I'll talk about them a little more later, but otherwise, I'm going to hand it off to Glenn. Glenn, take us away. Okay. Thanks very much. Pleasure to be here. For those of you who might not have uh, tuned in uh, to earlier programs, I'm Glenn Flickinger. And I host these Greatest Generation Live programs for the past now, going on three months, we've been working on uh, Masters of the Air. And uh, we're going to continue to uh, work on it too, even though the uh, series has ended. I think a lot of people are waiting for it to end and they're they're watching it, you know, uh, uh, all in, you know, one sitting or all in a couple of sittings. So uh, it's it's the it's the way uh, the world works these days. So I think we'll still have lots of interest as long as we keep getting interest from you, our viewers. Uh, we'll keep going. So uh, this week we we've got Colin Heaton. So hello, Colin. Hello, all. Okay, Colin's been a very faithful one of our faithful historian experts uh, with us. I think every evening for the past few months, Colin is. Uh, well, I'll get Colin to talk about his background in a minute. Uh, and then we have Joe McCarthy. Joe, say hello. Hello, everybody. Joe, Hi. coming to you all the way from, is it Maine, Joe? Port Portland, Maine. Portland, Maine. Wow. Formerly, formerly of Pittsburgh, though. Moved here a couple years ago. So I still watch Pittsburgh sports and uh, still keep in touch. I wanted to thank Glenn and Sean for the opportunity to tell my dad's story. I'm really excited. No Yankee accent yet, Joe. No, I'm not saying Pac or uh, Vast and Garden yet. <laughs> Give it a couple more years. <laughs> and uh, I, I do see Ed Cottrell. Ed, thank you for being on with us tonight. Great. And I think I saw Joe, Joe Peterburs. Are you here tonight as well? There he is. I see him. Thank you, guys. Always a pleasure to have our veterans with us. Uh, and just let me just glance through the room here. See if I see any of the other other veterans, but I see lots of familiar names, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you all. So let's get started. 
I, I do want to share one uh, item I want to promote. Sean, can I can I take the screen? Yes, you can, Glenn. You are co-host. Okay, I am co-host. I I got the power. I got the power. Okay, everybody seeing that, Sean? We can see it. Yes. So we just want to. Uh, we just made the formal announcement today with this email. You should have this email in your inbox, and that's for our 2024 Masters of the Air trip to England. Besides the fact that Ed Cottrell is joining us on the trip, which we had announced last week, we've added another uh, uh, event to our itinerary. Um, that is a, uh, a picture of one of the colleges in Cambridge, I believe. And this man ought to be pretty recognizable, Winston Churchill. No, he's not going to be presenting to us. We could not line him up as a speaker. Uh, but we are going to be visiting the Churchill archive, archives at, at uh, Cambridge University. Uh, thanks to the good graces of a Roxanne Hale. I don't know, Roxanne, I should have mentioned this. Or, are you on the program with us tonight? Do you see a Roxanne or a sailor? She goes by sailor. Um, Sean? Uh, I do not see her in the room right now, but I might be missing her. So Roxanne introduced us to Alan Packwood, who is the um, executive director of the archives in Cambridge. And we've had some conversation back and forth with him and his staff. And we've arranged for uh, an hour and a half program at the at the archives uh, that Sunday afternoon that we're in Cambridge. Saturday, we're at the Battle of Britain air show. Sunday as well, but we'll be back earlier on Sunday. And uh, Alan Packwood himself, who's written several books on Churchill, is going to be making a short presentation to us and giving us a tour of the of the archives. And um, I'm sure there's going to be more pictures of Winston Churchill there, but I doubt that he's going to show up. Uh, so I don't want to over promote it to make promises I can't keep. Um, so I just wanted to uh, uh, go through that uh, announcement again for uh, for our upcoming uh, trip. We have 20 some people uh, either signed up or very interested about the sign up. So if you're interested, please, uh, please contact us and let us know. Okay, Masters of the Air. So um, let's do a little review of the last episode. And I'd ask our members and our guests to give us give us some help here. Uh, usually about, we found that about 50% of you have been watching it, 50% have not. So final episode, excellent in every regard, except it could have been maybe two episodes long instead of one, as, as Sean mentioned. Um, there's really, I think, two or three features to it. Uh, it continues the story of the POWs, okay, with the Tuske two Tuskegee, Air there was three Tuskegee Airmen being there, and uh, the characters that, you know, we've been following all along, Egan and Clevin and a few of the others. Um, and it leads up to um, the the end of the war coming. They know they're, they're going to be liberated, but I believe it's in January or so, January, February of 45, uh, the Germans begin marching them to different camps. And these are these are done middle of the night sort of thing, uh, ice cold, terrible conditions, though already uh, pretty well, you know, pretty weak as it is. Um, and it's a pretty uh, compelling part of the story and a difficult part of the story is how they march these men, tens of thousands of men um, through the winter to different camps. Um, some of them escape. Um, it's uh, Clevin and one of his colleagues, I think, that escapes. Yeah, one of his, through two of his friends that escapes, and they show one of those friends uh, getting shot and killed during the escape. Um, and they finally make it back to camp. Uh, the other uh, part of the program is is a fascinating program by uh, part of the program uh, by uh, about Rosie. Uh, uh, boy, I'm I'm losing his last name. Why am I losing his last name? Uh, uh, Rosen, Rosenthal, Rosenthal, yeah. Rosie Rosenthal. Thank you. And uh, they do a very nice job of showing his last mission, his 52nd mission. If you remember, he he re-upped for another tour. So right at the end of the war in April of 45, they're bombing Berlin. His plane is shot up and he has to land his plane. 
and he guides it into Russian territory. And I think it was you, Colin, who told me how accurate you thought that was, because he actually landed the plane between the German and Russian lines just outside of Berlin. Yeah, he bailed out. The plane crashed. But that battle that he parachuted into, I interviewed about a dozen Russian and German veterans of that battle. And the way they described it, uh, I had no part in that making of the series. That was not my I was not asked to do that. But whoever did that did it accurately. And uh, they show Rosie then making it back to base by near the end of the war. So, and he's wounded as well. Um, so it's a pretty enthralling piece. And then the very end of the story, of course, is the liberation of the prisoner of war camp. We talked about that a few weeks ago, had some quite a bit of photos on it with Marilyn Walton uh, showing how Patton's third army, some armored columns showed up and liberated the camp. So it, it's, a, it's a stirring into the, to the series. And and with that description, I'll ask if anybody has any comments or thoughts on that last episode. Well, the flag raising wasn't historically accurate, as Marilyn pointed out. Uh, yes. There are a few discrepancies with regard to historical accuracy and poetic license, but if they had stuck to the actual historical story, you could have done another episode on it. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to have Marilyn back on uh, a Thursday night in April with a couple of other authors of POW books, and she's going to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Joe, yes, I. Joe, I was thinking about you when we were talking about Rosie because uh, you had very similar experience with the Russians. We need to unmute Joe, uh, Sean. Joe should be able to talk. Joe, can you can you talk? Oh. Joe, can you hear us? We'll ask Joe to unmute again, see if he has that on his, I know he just put in earbuds, so hopefully those work. No, Joe, uh, we're talking about Joe Peterburs, not Joe. Oh, I'm, I apologize. Joe Peterburs. Let me see if I can find him. My my apologies. Uh, Peterburs, there. There we are. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Joe, we asked you to unmute. There we go. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, now we can, Joe. Thank you. Well, the, the, the thing of the last episode, I'm sitting back in my chair, relaxed, watching it. And what's the first thing that comes on the screen? 3 February 1944. I mean, 1945. So that sounds like a familiar date. Mm. So I go to my logbook and I see that I flew on that mission. And uh, the, the, my logbook shows... Uh, uh, escort to uh, uh, Berlin and six hours and five minutes, heavy flak. <laughs> wow. Wow. That was, that was and, and, and the, the episode, that's how it was. <laughs> I was an eyewitness. So. It was real. And, yeah. and you know what, Joe, too, when I was watching that, if you remember last week, I, I was trying to get you to help those of us who all of us who weren't there except for ed cottrell as well and lucky but he's not on tonight um explain what that all looked like to have a thousand aircraft in the air a thousand bombers and 500 or 800 fighters and i i thought they did a pretty good job of portraying that oh absolutely absolutely and uh, you know it was it was awesome for us too you know we you know the, the fighter squadron they had all grouped and the bombers would all be grouping, and then we'd rendezvous, you know, 900, 1,000 fighters meeting a couple of thousand bombers or 1,500 bombers at a at a IP uh, a point, at, I mean, a rendezvous point, and then all heading to the IP, and then the bombers splitting, they had always have four or five targets, and different groups would be uh, assigned different targets, like a my mass met last mission there was brandenburg back uh magdeburg uh, berlin potsdam and Oranienburg. so our group was about 400 aircraft out of the, the 1200 so and and all us is contrails are going and it was a beautiful day when you started and it becomes an overcast in a hurry and then when there's battles then there's uh, just complete chaos there's engines and parachutes and all that sort of stuff in the air as well as the enemy again chills down my back of my neck to 
listen to that, Joe. And again, the way they are able to use those com the computer graphics, it's all computer graphics, yet it looks absolutely real. Yeah. Anybody else like to volunteer any thoughts on uh, the last episode of uh, Masters of the Air? Put us into gallery mode here in case anybody waves their hand in front of the screen. I should be able to see you. I, I just had a quick comment. When they were forced marching the POWs to another camp, there was a scene where one of the German guards was was ready to fall, and one of the POW, POWs oh, yeah. helped him up. Yeah. I, I thought that was incredible. Yeah. I Do you it's, think it's, I know that if I know that if one of the Americans or the prisoners fell out of line, it was possible they'd be executed on those marches. If a German soldier did that as well, would they would they execute their own? No, the Luftwaffe guys wouldn't have done it, but if they had SS accompanying them, they would have probably shot him. Scott Masters, you got your hand up? Yeah, I was just curious, and I'm sure there's somebody here who can answer, but the scenes where Rosie went down um and visited the the concentration camp i was wondering if that is rooted in fact or if that was something that was maybe you know historically i don't want to say exaggerated i think it was obviously an important part of the story but i was wondering if that was uh entirely truthful that sequence that i don't know marilyn walton could better answer that but i did interview a guy who was a b24 crew member i don't remember his position or which group but he actually parachuted into Mauthausen as it was being abandoned. And he came down as the Soviets were closing in on the camp. Uh, so, and that was his experience. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm going to take a guess, uh, Scott, th that it was an added, you know, sort of representative scene, much like Band of Brothers, you know, the, what that, that scene, which is very poignant in Band of Brothers where they find the camp. Uh, that never happened to Easy Company of the 101st. It obviously happened to a lot of other people. And I, I, I think justifiably show they're trying to illustrate what happened in general. But, uh, yeah, I don't know if Rosie actually visited the camp or not. I don't, I don't know either. Thank you. Okay, if unless anybody else would like to make a comment on the actual... Uh, Masters of the uh, Air episodes. We'll we'll move on to oh, our. We have a couple. Uh, oh, okay. uh, Jeff Jeff Chivers and Nancy Putnam. Uh, see whoever is able to unmute first here. Jeff, go ahead, and then Nancy. Uh, yeah, look. What I want to say, I don't know if uh, other people felt the same way. I thought after all the drama, all the uh, the sacrifice, and this incredible um, effort by everybody, all consuming for you know for some people a year, two years even. I was really touched at the end. I thought they did a heck of a nice job with the farewell, which is the children um, standing there and waving goodbye uh, as the men just very quietly got in the planes and uh, went back. Um, I just, you know, it's interesting to me. I, I was really moved by that. And I thought, my gosh, these incredible experiences, all this sacrifice, all the brave men, as the character said at the end. And here's this, just this, one moment, uh, all this is over and farewell and the children doing it. I thought, I thought it was a really, I'm just from a dramatic standpoint and, and life is like that, isn't it? And I thought it was very, very well done. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to say one thing there. Do you remember the airdrop where they were dropping the food in Holland? Yeah. There was a very young girl who had been starving for years who actually jumped on one of those packages that almost hit her. Her name was Audrey Hepburn. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a great story of Audrey Hepburn. That's yeah. Nancy. Yep. Yes. Um, I can answer a lot of those questions. I'm with the hundredth bomb group foundation. My dad was a command pilot and a POW. So I can see some of the questions are obvious. The B 17 G's, no, that was a limitation to the CGI, what Apple would pay for. That's pretty much out there. And I'm aware that that is true. Um, I agree with everybody. I thought that the um, graphics were, the CGI overall was extremely well done. I can tell you being on the inside that 
uh, as your fighter pilots have said, the, um, uh, the, the battle scenes, in particular Berlin, but Trondheim, uh, Regensburg, the others before it, are historically accurate. When you see a, a B-17 peel away, that is the plane that peeled away. And they were very, very careful. They had formation sheets for each of those battles. They had all the post-mission briefings. They had That was all absolutely authentic. Uh, regarding Rosie, who I did know very well, he was my dad's roommate all through pilot training, and they both ended up in the 100th Bomb Group. Um, that is exactly as Glenn said. That is a, not I, I don't like to use the word contrived, but that was um, an imagined um, scene. Uh, representative when, experience, ex perhaps. Exactly. Uh, now, as you know, Rosie ended up behind the Russian lines. He ended up in Moscow, wined and dined with Avril Harriman. They then put him on the ground and took him through Poland to get him out and back to England. Um, in the distance, he did see a camp. Uh, we don't know which one because he's not, he was never quite sure of his route to be able to reconstruct that. But that uh, he, he did see, you know, there were a fair number of camps, some large, some small. And he definitely went by one. He did never, he never did get out and go into a camp. So that is, I, I know that for a fact. So that is how they did it. And then I'll have one last comment. Again, my dad, when he got out of POW camp, he was at, at Barth, not at uh, not at three. But um, the scene that hit me the most was Clevin and Rosie get into a plane and they, that is also contrived. They did not get into a plane and fly one of the Chowhound missions. But um, the what they were showing there was that these guys who were such amazing pilots had focused for so long on just staying alive and doing their jobs the best they could, win the war. And all the POWs who were pilots, all they wanted to do is get back to base and get back in a plane. They wanted yeah. to find out who of their friends had lived. My dad did exactly the same thing. And I years later met his uh, uh, ground crew chief who told me about it. And that was really common. And I think there were some universal scenes like that, that those of us whose um, relatives flew in the war, survived the war, we've heard these stories. And so I really, um, I was ecstatic with how the final um, uh, episode went. And of course, being in the 100th and knowing all the vets who were in the documentary, I was with Lucky, who you've interviewed on your show many times. We celebrated Lucky's 102nd birthday together last Mar la last Friday, um, yeah. and it was to to see it to see the, the the final scenes. It was great. So, any other questions? I'm pretty pretty much on the inside. I can probably answer them. Well, thank you, Nancy, very much. I, we're, we're very happy to have you on the program. What was your your father's full name? Gerald Putnam. And he was uh, for 349 Squadron. When he was uh, leading the 13th Combat Win on on uh, March 3rd, which was one of the recalled missions, um, but three lead planes were shot down in 1944. So he, he became a POW. Yep, he was an office. He was an operations officer and command pilot. Shot down. Yep, he ended up at Barth. So. Well, thank you. Uh, I hope you come on future programs. We're going to have Marilyn Walton on again yep. in a couple of weeks time. And uh, yeah, know. I've tuned into some. I haven't. I've put some messages up, but um, I, I tuned into Kevin and Lucky. And when I'm available, um, I've caught then try and catch the podcast. It's it's great. You're doing. A, I'm very anxious to hear how hear how the German fighters shot down the B-17s. My dad was shot down by. Um, FW 90s, 190s. So, yep. I'm curious to hear how you present that. Well, we're going to jump into that right now with the yep. man who knows uh, more about that than anybody I know. Um, and just one last reference here, and we'll jump into the main program. <laughs> um, if you had the chance, if you have the chance to watch the documentary that follows the Bloody 100, yep. please watch it. It's as as Nancy mentioned, yeah. it's very well done. It's the it's same so people who did the documentaries after Band of Brothers in the Pacific. Yeah. 
And, yep. and what, what's neat about it is that most of these men have passed other than Lucky and a couple of others, I guess. But they were able to go back and find archival footage of Rosie. We and have tons of archival footage. We worked tirelessly for two years to get permission to use it. Um, Frank, Frank Murphy was obviously brilliant in that. His daughter, Chloe, I mean, his granddaughter, Chloe Melas, who a lot of people know from NBC um, Today Show, and uh, she republished his book. And if you've never, have, has anybody ever talked to you about Luck of the Draw? Oh, no, we, we had Chloe on back in early January. Did you? I missed. OK, I'll have to go back and look at that. Um, yeah. yeah, no. Chloe, so that is um, yeah, I'm, I'm heavily involved with that. So, yeah, no, the documentary was excellent. Her Mark Herzog is amazing. Yeah, a lot of us were involved in that. Right. So. Right. Well, again, thank you, Nancy. We, we love having you. Thank in. you. Thank you for the series. It's been interesting when I've been able to tune in. It's been fun. It's been really, really good and um, a labor of love for, for us at the VVC. L let's go into, it's almost eight o'clock and, and uh, uh, or sorry, it's almost 7.30. And I want to make sure we give enough time for the program that Joe and Colin have put together here, which is just so well done. Uh, they've, they've put a lot of effort into this. And let me get things teed up here. Okay. Now, um, is there a Bob Von Bargain Bargain on uh, right now? If if he is, could could he rec be recognized, uh, Sean? Please. Yes, I uh, I asked Bob to unmute. Okay. Bob, uh, you sent this uh, cartoon in. Let me get it to that page. Earlier today, um, you sent it to Todd, who sent it on to me. I just thought it was pretty cute. What is there a story behind this? Well, <clears throat> Bob Stevens for many years uh, uh, um, was he's a cartoonist. He was a uh, fighter pilot, Second World War, and uh, these were published in the uh, Air Force uh, Association uh, 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 ma uh, magazine. It was the last page in the magazine, and I knew I had that somewhere, and. Uh, it took me a while to find it, and I thought you'd enjoy seeing it because uh, I think it summarizes the, uh, it, it says, the spacious nose section. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think you could say the same thing for a B-17. Yeah, yeah. Well done. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Okay, so let's go to uh, Joe McCarthy to start this. Joe? So as Joe said earlier, um, uh, his father, Joseph McCart McCarthy, was a flight engineer, top turret gunner uh, in the 8th Air Force. And uh, Joe has done a lot of research into not only his father's service, but um, uh, defending a B-17. So, Joe, take us away. Tell us about your father here in these first couple of slides. Thank you, Glenn. Um, well... My father was in the 91st Bomb Group, uh, 322nd Squadron. The 91st Bomb Group uh, was the Bomb Group Memphis Bell was part of. And the 91st were called the Ragged Irregulars because they were so shot up um, after they returned from missions, they couldn't even get squadrons and bomb groups together. Hmm. Uh, so that was their little tag. Um, so. In the picture to the left and to the right, that's dad um, in his um, base in England. Uh, Bassenborn was the name of the base. And that that uh, scrapbook picture reminded me of uh, Buck uh, Clevin uh, landing in, uh, was it Algiers, North Africa, and they, all the crew had their shirts off. So I couldn't resist putting uh, dad in the, the picture. And then he was, uh, a uh, technical sergeant, so he earned his stripes, um, and um, that's a picture of him with his wings as well. Mm -hmm. uh, he started out in uh, in, in Pittsburgh uh, and started uh, uh, enlisted, and then and it ended up in the Army Air Force because he said that the Air Force had more skills and training than the other uh, uh, areas of the military. Uh, so. Second picture is uh, dad um, 
with his, uh, they called them bullet wings, gunner's wings, because they had a little bullet in between the, uh, the wings. Uh, he started out uh, with an av av aviation cadet program, and, but he washed out fairly quickly. They washed out tens of thousands of uh, prospective pilots. And then uh, was in uh, aviation um, aircraft and engine mechanics school, they called it. Uh, spent uh, over a year doing that and then it ended up in gunnery school in Las Vegas, Nevada. And that's when um, they really got into the, the finer points of uh, being an aerial gunner. On the left there, that's actual um, uh, picture of them firing shotguns, uh, a skeet. Um, that's Burgess Meredith in there, formerly the Penguin on the Batman series. Did uh, some of the films like uh, uh, Tim in the middle. That's that, that him in the middle photograph, Burgess Meredith. That's him in the left shooting the shotgun. He was actually a pretty oh. good marksman with a shotgun. Oh, okay. So they started out shoot skating uh, shotguns. Then they went into the right, far right uh, picture of uh, actually firing uh, machine guns uh, from Jeeps and, and uh, trucks at moving targets that were maybe going in circles and the trucks were going in circles. So that led them to start using um, the uh, gun sites that they would later you know, be using in their, in their stations. And then eventually they um, progressed into flying uh, A-10 uh, trainers and actually firing at towed targets. Hmm. Uh, so this is where they actually got their their uh, wings. And then this is a, a actual towed target. Uh, the women Air Force service pilots were in debt to them. They were flying these um, tow planes. That target was about 14 feet long, so they didn't have a whole lot to shoot at. Wasn't that close, that far away from the plane? And Dad used to say they would actually shoot down some of the tow planes because uh, these guys were just learning. Um, you... One of the things they stressed in gunnery school: two second bursts, no more. And we learned that from Lucky Luckadoo when he was in the tail. He ended up burning out his uh, barrels because he was firing away too long. The other thing they stressed was don't shoot down friendly air aircraft. Uh, right next to the information. They were always talking about that. Yeah. Um, the, the graph to the right um, talks about um, some of the uh, statistics as far as enemy aircraft that were shot down. In that graph, they're talking in the course of the war over 6,000. But then later they reduced all the claims by 55% because there was so much over claiming. You can imagine five gunners opening up on a Mercer Smith ME 109 coming in. All five say they got hits because they saw the engine catch fire. So five claims were put in, and yeah. and Colin can talk to that uh, also. But that those numbers kind of are uh, are pretty uh, questionable. Was your father uh, accustomed to guns before he went into the military? He Was a little he... deer hunting, um, but nothing like you know firing a 50 caliber machine gun. Yeah. They they had a he told me they had a drill. If you fired more than uh, two second bursts, they would run you around in the desert with a parachute strapped to you. So you learn not to do that. Wow. They also use colored bullets. So if you're firing away at that towed target, these mm. bullets were 50 cal bullets were dipped in, in colored uh, paint. So let's say dad was firing and his bullets were red. If he hit the target, it, you'd see red marks in uh, the toad target, and that's how they could tell they were getting some hits. So that's the famous uh, tracers. Well, the, the tracer, they were taught actually not to use tracers, more so the, the, the actual, um, the, the tracers were good, but they, they could be misleading at times. So mm -hmm. they painted all the bullets in colors. So if you hit it, hit a tracer, regular uh, lead, it, it would show up in that target. So help me understand what uh, what was a tracer? A tracer had I, th I thought fifth, it was a colored bullet. Every fifth bullet was a tracer, which was a, a, a phosphorus type material. So when it went off, you see a, a a flame, and those are the things that in the Masters of the Air series you can see the flashes from the German right. fighters fighter the 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 
50 caliber uh, guns opening up, every fifth was the tracer. Okay. So if you shot two second burst, you shot 28 bullets and every fifth would be a tracer. 28 bullets in two seconds. Wow. In two seconds. Yeah, yeah, and American tracers were red. German was green. So ah, interesting. Okay, let's let's go to this next slide, and then we'll we'll pull uh, Colin into the discussion. So, so I guess the question from everybody in gunnery school: How do we shoot down a fighter going four hundred mile per hour, and in mean, all different directions? Um, so I guess the answer was, and this is what my dad told me when I was a young man asking him about wartime, he said, rad deflection, that's how we did it. And I didn't really know what he was talking about until I started drilling down into you know, more information. So um, rad is the radius of the ring gun sight. So in, in the left side there, you can see left middle, you can see one rad is the radius. And then uh, you can est from the gun sight, you can estimate how far away the plane is. It's 600 yards distance. They were told to open up. And you can see that's a small speck if you're looking at a, a, a already uh, you know um, hard to find a fighter just coming by you. They were also told to um, uh, use deflection. So deflection is the amount you aim away from the fighter, and you had to memorize these tables. So let's say the waist gunner is uh, firing away. He had to use three rads of deflection. So three radiuses on that gun sight, very easily, you wouldn't even see the plane in the gun sight. They were so far off. But on the top and bottom of that graph, you see there's no deflection. So the tail gunner in particular had no deflection issues. He could aim right at the fighter, right in the middle of the bullseye. And the same for like the top turret gunner or the chin turret gunner could aim straight away use a little bit of deflection if it's a little bit left of center. Well, maybe one, but that's still, that's a lot better than three that the waist gunners had to use. So we've got the Flying Fortress and the B-24, even though it didn't have the glamorous name, same point, 12 50 caliber machine guns spread throughout the plane, front, back, side, up, down, with, if you imagine this as almost like a, in the, the that B seventeen or twenty four is in the middle of a of a ball, and and the diameter around that ball is the radius that they can shoot these machine guns, and you're trying to shoot these things as they're flying by at four hundred miles an hour, which I still have a hard time thinking anybody can do that, but obviously they did. I all the all the gunners had to use these open gun sights except for the top and ball turn. And we'll talk about that in the coming slides, how they did it. And my dad had had the uh, special, they called it a Sperry gun, gun sight. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that coming up. So this is, this is how the B-17s, it's not everything, we'll get into more, but this is basically how the B-17s defended themselves. And Colin, what were the Germans thinking? How were they gonna take them down? Well. But the first missions to France in 1942, there were only two fighter wings stationed there, JG-2 Richthofen and JG-26 Schlegeter, which was at that time, uh, 26 was commanded by my old friend Adolf Galland uh, up until uh, around February 42 before the missions really started. And then he became general of the fighters. But the man holding the B-17 model, it was uh, is Georg Pater Eder. He and Egan Meyer, JG-2, began the school to shoot down B-17s. And they started shooting them down with rear attacks, flank attacks, but they were taking a lot of damage, a lot of hits. The tail gunners, ball turrets were really raking them coming in because they had plenty of time to put a bead on them. Ader and Meyer got their heads together and said, there's got to be a better way to hit these. Uh, they use the word bastards. That's what a Ader told me. And uh, so then they went to Dadoff Galland here and said, hey, we have an idea. We're going to try it out. And the next four or five missions, they tried the frontal attack, different angles, scored some kills and Gallon said, okay, run a school, run all these guys through it. And then we're going to start attacking these bombers from the front. And, and we should be able to, you know, at least rectify the problem. The problem with the frontal attack was if a pilot like Ader once had his rudder cable shot away and he could not move out of the way of a frontal attack. So this is an actual photograph of a B-17 that we believe is one he impacted with. 
he knew the crash was coming. So he just jettisoned his canopy, released his uh, seat straps and just jumped out right before the impact. And, uh, and this is the result taken from what they think might've been the uh, camera film from another B-17 that had a journalist on board that was shot down on the mission. And this particular mission, if I'm not mistaken, was one over, uh, I think it was Rouen, but I, I could be wrong. Um, but that's what they did. They decided to go to the final attack. And then uh, this was especially true after Curtis LeMay created the bomber box formation. Uh, they had to go to the final attack because the box formation was so geometrically precise in, in covering the angles that they were losing like three or four fighters per mission and one or two pilots per mission. So when they went to the final attack, they were more effective. The bomber box was effective which is why later they came out with the B-17G with the front chin turret to try to deter the final attack, which didn't work. They still did it. And this image here shows the uh, method of a final attack from what we call the 12 o'clock dead ahead position, which is one of four methods of attacking from the front. And the pilots, uh, 109s or 190s, would fly in, fire, and pull up and try to roll away and dive to get away from the, uh, the gunners in the formation. So say that again, uh, Colin, there were in this particular attack profile, there were four different strategies attacking the front. Yeah, you had the 12 o'clock level attack where you could fly in head on at a bomber and fire at the nose or the engines, and then you could pull up and roll away or you could dive and roll away. Then you had the 11 o'clock and one o'clock attack positions, which gave you a little more lead time, a bigger target, which means you could come in as a German pilot ain't lead the target fire a two three second burst because it gave you more time and then you could do the same maneuver dive away or roll away uh left or right so you had your option as a pilot some pilots were better at the angle attack some were better at the head-on some were better at 12 o'clock high diving in attack eight are specialized in coming in high rolling upside down and diving into the path of the bomber leading the bomber with his cannons and machine guns and then right as he saw the impacts hitting the rudder spinning around and diving and passing right over the bomber which got him shot down 17 times and wounded 14 times during the war <laughs> and he survived i mean and he survived i interviewed him when 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 you watch uh the the combat footage or you see the uh you know Masters of the Air series where it's CG, it, it it almost, to me, it looks like the German fighters are sort of just random. They're just sort of running through the pack of B-17s and shooting down what they can. And in reality, they had very strategic or very tactical uh, methods involved in how they were attacking. That's correct. The, they, every, every fighter attack had an airborne coordinator. And the coordinator is normally the Gruppen Commandeur. And he, like the... Uh, the, the group leader yeah. and so he would coordinate the attacks and he would say which echelon of fighters attack which echelon of bombers and they would follow his instructions and then they would go in for the kill now this is the fighter this is the 109 of uh Luftwaffe ace anton hackel who shot down 192 aircraft during the war of which 30 i think 34 were four engine bombers this is his particular personal aircraft on the russian front when he transferred over he still flew this aircraft until he got shot down then he transferred to his fw190 and that is his FW-190. And he's the only pilot on the Western Front to still fly with a yellow tail band, which is indicative of the Eastern Front. And they asked him, why do you still, I asked Anton when I interviewed him, why did you still fly with a yellow tail band? He said, I didn't want anyone to mistake me for anybody else. <laughs> is that an extra gas tank underneath or is that a bomb? No, that's a fuel tank. That that That's the ex external fuel tank that uh, the Falk Wolves would fly with to give them extra range. Because what would happen once the, the coastal radar picked up the bomber formations, Gallen gave the order to all of the Geschwader Commodora to uh, make sure that they had their fighters in the air in four waves, minimum four waves. The first wave would be to screen the unit and count the aircraft radio back their position and number. And then they would engage whatever fighter escort was there until they had to turn back. And as soon as the fighter escort was low on fuel, they would bounce the fighters and try to get a few kills. The second wave, 15, 20 minutes behind, would then engage the bombers. Both of those first two waves would land on whatever air base was available. The next three and four waves would hit those bombers again. And by the time the fourth wave hit and the bombers hit the target and turned back, the first two or three waves would be back in the air, refueled, rearmed, and hitting them again. Sounds very method, uh, methodical, very German. 
<laughs> yeah, it was very, it was tactically planned. And, Ga and Gallon told me personally that he actually sat down with two mathematicians to calculate the refueling time, the landing time, takeoff time, reaching altitude, and they got it down to a science. Now, this is Anton in his uh, FW-190 in which he scored, I think, 19 or 20 of his bomber kills before this aircraft was lost. And then he had another 190 that was given to him as a gift by Kurt Tonk and said, here, this is for you. Take it. it it's got extra armor because we, we know you get shot down a lot. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, that's Anton right there. Now, this is the cockpit of the FW-190A6. The configuration didn't change from the A4 to the A8 series very much. What you see up top on the one o'clock position is the Revy gun sight. And above that is a, is a clear, what looks like a glass right there. That's where your illuminated sight would come. And I can tell you right now of the hundred of the hundred plus Luftwaffe pilots I interviewed, not a single one used that gun sight attacking bombers. Why is that? Well, it didn't make any difference because when you're closing in at uh, 650 miles per hour, closing speeds, the gun sight's irrelevant because by the time you look at the gun sight, you're already in the face of the uh, of, of the navigator or somebody, you know. So they just looked through the windshield and they saw and they just basically used, you know, sp spray and pray with lead. And uh, the gun sight was virtually ineffective on a frontal attack. Yeah. So, Joe, let's come back to you because uh, sure. obviously Germans are being very methodical and 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 uh, their attack. We're doing the same thing in our defense. That's right. Uh, so the so the gunner uh, in the tail uh, is aiming his twin fifty caliber machine guns at the B point, and with the rad deflection system, the bullets would actually hit at the A point, you know, center of the plane. So this was uh, kind of portrayed in Masters of the Air with. Uh, Rosie Rosenthal, Rosenthal uh, doing all the aerial gyrations to try to keep the German fighters on his tail. In fact, he said, I'm trying to keep them on my back porch, I think he said. That was because the tail gunner didn't have to really deal much with um, deflection. He could actually just shoot mostly right from the, the gun sights. And that was really effective um, in keeping those fighters away so he could return. Bill de Blasio was his tail gunner, and Bill claimed that he shot down six fighters on that way home from the Munster raid. Now, since the plane, you know, was all alone, nobody could verify that because you had to have another witness, and it wasn't just your crew. But um, yeah. that that was really demonstrated, I think, pretty well in in the Masters of the Air. Yeah. And and didn't you tell me that 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 for the most part it was the tail gunners. We ended up being the ace aces. Yeah, the, the, there's triple aces. Micah Ruth was his name. He was a tail gunner. Uh, uh, had 17 German fighters shot down. And John Quinlan, who was the tail gunner on Memphis Bell, had five enemy fighters shot down and three more on a B-29 because he re-upped uh, to continue in the Pacific. Uh, so, yeah, that was, as Colin pointed out that was pretty effective to the Germans caught on and said, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to come head on. Right. Right. And then uh, I think this next slide, Colin, was something we put in here. This is uh, from a German fighter's point of view, attacking the rear of the B-17. Yeah, this is actual gun camera film from Georg Peter Ader, the guy in the first photograph holding the B-17 model. And by the way, that model was made by a 14 year old schoolboy. <laughs> Uh, who carved it out of wood. Anyway, but this is Gorgator's camera footage of an early B-17 shootdown. You see the strikes on the tail. He killed the tail gunner, and he took the bomber down, but he also got shot down by the tail gunner before he died, so he had to jump out of his 109. He was in a 109 at this time, and uh, so he bailed out of the 109, and this is the episode, this is the situation where he bailed out under parachute. The crew began bailing out under parachute. One of the B-17 pilots pulled a 45 on him because they were like 50 feet apart in the air. And uh, Ader just pointed to the ground, like looked down. And the guy looked down and saw dozens of German soldiers waiting for them to hit the ground. So he just threw the 45 away and threw his hands up like, what the hell? You know, <laughs> nothing I can do about this. Not going to be uh, successful in escaping that now. 
This, I thought, was interesting in our discussion over the last couple of days relative to what was portrayed in the Ep Masters of the Air episodes. What are we looking at? This is the uh, 109 G4 of Heinz Ganoka. He uh, began his unit, JG-11, began using the underwing mortars. Now, when you see the or, or hear about the veterans talking about rockets being shot at them, they weren't rockets. They were underwing mortars. And they were fire and forget mechanisms. You just, you just fired them into the formation, hope for the best. Kanoka began doing that. And uh, and then he began dropping 250 kilogram bombs with the proximity fuses into the formations to try to use it like an aerial flak. Uh, and he was pretty effective. And uh, during his interview, he said that uh, he, he only got one B-17 victory uh, out of, uh, oh, well, I guess... 116 missions or something going against them, but uh, that uh, actually brought one down. The rest of them were just a waste of ordnance. With, with with the dropping of the bombs, but what about these mortars? Were they fairly no, effective? No, I was talking about the mortars. About the mortars. <laughs> yeah, the bombs weren't very effective at all because you had to really... He did hit one. He got a direct hit on a B-24 once. Yeah. But... Uh, this and that's Heinz tough. right there. Uh, he, he he still looked. He didn't look in 1984. He didn't look any different, very much from that picture in 1944. So now, did eventually the uh, Luftwaffe use actual rockets, actual air-to-air -air rockets later in the war? Yeah, R4M rockets were mounted on the Me262 jets, uh, starting in about uh, August of 43. They were tested, and then by October of 44. They were used in combat. Uh, well, not in combat. They, they were tested still with Commando Novotny. And Walter Schuch's unit, JG-7 and JV-44 under Gallen, used them rather extensively. Yeah. Okay. And we're going to talk about the 262 a little bit later. Okay. Real quick, so real quick Glenn. Uh, in the chat, Carol uh, asks, or William, uh, what was in the flak that could damage the planes? Uh, well, Tr shrapnel. shrapnel. <laughs> yeah. This was... Uh, yeah, you know, I, I don't know how to describe it other than a lot of metal inside of that shell, and it and when it when it exploded, just like a mortar shell or artillery shell. In fact, it was an artillery shell. It exploded into thousands of pieces of small pieces of metal, hurled outward at incredible speed. And by the way, it wasn't just American bombers and fighters that caught shrapnel. A lot of German pilots landed with a piece stuck in their parachute or in their seat or in their fuselage. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there were times when the fighters, the Luftwaffe, would actually attack uh, through the flak, which got to be pretty crazy to do. But And a good okay. follow-up question from Brad is, what was the effective radius of the flak burst? That depended upon the caliber of the gun and the powder charge. The uh, the pack charge on an 88 millimeter fired, exploding, the, the blast radius on that would be about, about 100 and, uh, 150 to 160 uh, feet in a, in a radius. The 105 millimeter gave it about 200, um, if that helps. there's We're, we're going to be talking about Curtis LeMay in just a couple of slides, and I'll come back. I, I think I've told the story before, but I'll tell it again because it's relevant to Brad's question as to how he calculated um, mm -hmm. how many rounds of 88 it would take to shoot down one B-17. And we'll talk about that in a second. Joe, what are we looking at here? I I, I didn't know they had uh, computers back then. Yeah, this was um, this was my dad uh, in the top turret looking out through this optical gun sight manufactured by Sperry. Uh, they uh, created a, a mechanical computer. Obviously, didn't have printed circuits and transistors back then, but this computer only found on the top and ball turret would calculate um, the, the speed of the plane, allow for gravity, deflection, and all you had to do was frame the, the fighter in the optical sight, the wings of the fighter. So on the bottom right, I don't know if you can see, there's two vertical lines and then a horizontal. Yeah. If you could keep the fighter wing, and the wings were about the same. The FW-190 uh, and the ME-109 were about the same size. So th there was an adjustment that the gunner didn't have to worry about that. Just put the, uh, the the wing in between those two vertical lines. And in the um, left picture, you see if you're aiming at B through that optical uh, sight, the bullets are going to hit C. 
And that will take in, into effect, again, all those different variables. So this was something that the, the gunners were told to smash. Like the Norden bomb site, it was kind of semi top secret. But they were to, to, to smash that if they knew they were uh, going to ditch or go or go or uh, not ditch, but land uh, uh, force landing. Right. Okay. And this is a, a illustration I've shown before, and it, it it's trying to illustrate. It's a hard thing to illustrate <laughs> the uh, the box the combat box formation that Curtis LeMay came up with in late 42. Do I have, have that approximately right, Colin and Joe? Uh, no, 43. He came up with the box formation in 43 because after the after the Schweinfurt Regensburg raid with such horrendous losses, he tried to implement that and get approval. And then after the October Regensburg raid, that uh, was e even more destructive. They finally said, okay, yeah, we're going to start using this box formation. Although in his bond group, they, they used it, but it didn't become universal until, you know, the powers so that be said, you know, this I, might work. I'm pretty sure that LeMay used it in his bomber group within a couple months of him arriving in October of 42. He November, was November 42, I think he's when he started doing it because he saw the relevance of protecting against fighters, but he, he was one of the enlightened ones. The rest were a little behind him. I mean, he actually had to go sell it, and it took quite a few months to the you know the more senior commanders in, in the 8th Air Force. Yeah, Ira Aker wasn't exactly a user-friendly component with, with regard to Curtis LeMay's personality. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Well, LeMay's first boss was, uh, uh, what's his name? They called him the Eagle, uh, Hayward, Spence, uh, Hayward, Haywood. Yeah. Uh, oh, and don't, and don't forget that, uh, uh Curtis LeMay was the, uh, protege of, of General Robert Olds, the father of General Robin Olds and yeah. Robert Olds had been the protege of Billy Mitchell. Yeah. 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 There's quite a heritage group. In that box formation, uh, if you just keep that one up there, just one second. Um, sure. When Dad would go to briefings, if if uh, their squadron, th this is uh, basically a squadron. These are twelve planes. But if their uh, designation was to be at the low low position, they called that Tell in Charlie because that was the easiest position for the Germans to kind of fly in and attack the the, the formation. Right. Uh, that was really stressful for pilots to keep that tight formation. They would alternate, from what I understand, the co-pilot and pilot would alternate every 15 minutes because it was so stressful to keep that tight formation. But that was the key to the survival of the squadron, to keep everything tied up so that the guns could um, uh, have zones of um, attack. And we'll talk about that in the next slide. And, and you can imagine, so this is the box formation for a squadron, and then the box then applied to the group, which is four of these squadrons, three or four of them, and then this, that, that applied to the wing, and it just kept sort of multiplying and getting bigger and bigger and longer. And in effect, you had this huge flying box, eventually, you know, 15, 20 miles long and several miles high. So... This is a great illustration that Joe showed because um, it really shows, I, I think, the, the effectiveness of all these machine guns. Joe, you want to explain this? Yeah, first off, th these show the 13 guns in the positions. Uh, this is the uh, B-17G with the chin turret. Uh, there were a number of comments that the, the G was not featured in Masters of the Air. And I, I think Nancy pointed out it was due to budget reasons, time reasons. But this was, uh, the, the chin turn came into effect in the late uh, months of 43. There was yeah. actually some training uh, documentation of training pilots, to, uh, uh, gunners to use the, the, the chin turn. Um, and you can see the, uh, the gunners had to stick to their cones of, of fire. So if you were in the um, tail, you can see that cone was fairly narrow. You could just look at that area and not be bothered by other areas. Now, if you had, as Colin explained, if you had a front end uh, 12 o'clock level coming in and that pilot flew over top, the tail gunner pick, could pick him up or uh, on the way 
past the, the B-17. So that's when they, they would call out, you know, bandits, 12 o'clock high coming in. They knew that uh, each gunner uh, would maybe have a crack at them as they were kind of flying by. This also showed the number of uh, how much ammunition each station had with the um, tail gunner actually having uh, one of the most, they had about 1,100 rounds. The uh, waist gunners had quite a bit too. They had about 1,200 rounds. The uh, chin, uh, I'm sorry, the, um, uh, the uh, turrets uh, in the cheek, they were called, didn't have that much rounds. They were um, featured in the F series and that was really for the um, navigator to use. You can imagine how crammed that was with um, yeah. the, that, the gun's sights in the chin as well as the navigators trying to shoot. And we, 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 we've talked about General LeMay several times. Here here he's, uh, this is even maybe after the war, he's got three stars. I can't remember if he ever got three stars by the end of the war. But uh, he was uh, uh, just a bomber group commander when he first uh, arrived in England. Uh, I might, he might have been a brigadier general when he first arrived. Anyway, he, he was the one, as we were talking earlier, that came up with this box formation and 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 began it in his own bomber group, and then eventually spread to the rest. And Brad, the what he did is I, as because I, I've read his biography. I think I've read Colin's book about him or other biographies of him. Um, you know, he he went to bed one night puzzling about the fact that the, at that time in late forty two, the B seventeens would take evasive action as they were arriving at the bomb point. And he was like, well, what's what's the point of trying to bomb this target? If we're, if we're flying all over the place, we're never going to be accurate. We need to fly directly over the target, starting from some you know initial point 10, 12 miles away and not vary ourselves. So, you know, it, it, what he calculated, he, he went back to his ROTC artillery book, as I understand the story, mm. and calculated that it would take 278 shells from a 88 or other anti-aircraft guns to shoot down one B-17. And then he took that against how long they would be over the target. It's, Colin, it, you embellish that story any? And yeah, LeMay told me, I mean, you you have my book, I guess, where I interviewed him, and, and he was kind of pretty precise. I mean, that's the kind of guy he was. Uh, his math was off. Uh, actually, it turned out to be more like 6,000 rounds of anti-aircraft artillery to bring down a bomber. Wow. Uh, and that was from the German viewpoint. And that's when uh, Hitler was talking about, well, the fighters aren't being effective. You know, they're not bringing down enough bombers. Maybe I should just, you know, transfer our industry to building anti-aircraft artillery. And that's when Joseph Kammuber said, well, that's a, that's OK, mein Fuhrer. But bear in mind that one fighter could take out one or two bombers, but it takes about 6,000 rounds of anti-aircraft fire to bring down a bomber. So cost effectively, you might want to keep the fighters. And Gallon and he Gallon bought him dinner after that because he said, thank you, just saved my branch of service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, so I took down the share for a couple of minutes, uh, Sean, to see if there's uh, it's it's eight o'clock to see if there's some other questions before we get into the second half of our uh, program and uh, the station break as well, Sean. Sure, we'll do station break in just a minute. Had a couple extra uh, questions here. Brad Washabaugh, how easy was it to clear a 50 caliber gun when it jammed or malfunctioned? At yeah, 40 interesting. below zero. <laughs> the, the problem with the gun jamming was the same problem that had the bombs hang up on the shackles. Uh, you know, everybody associates London fog well, these planes were sitting out at night uh, with the with the crews um, uh, loading up bombs, but then the gunners brought their guns out and they had to wipe them down so that the uh, cold wouldn't freeze up the mechanism and and then jam the gun. But it was hard with these gloves on, triple layered gloves to uh, unjam these things, but the gunners were taught to unjam them blindfolded. They, in gunnery school, they actually put in parts that were bad uh, so that they could really easily unjam those things. So they could do that. They don't want to take off their take off their gloves like in the Masters of the Air that showed one of the gunners in the tail getting frostbitten. But as long as they kept everything dry before and they loaded their guns, they carried their guns out. Some of them put their guns next to the uh, stove 
to keep it warm. And then they walked them out and loaded them into their turrets, their stations, and, and had uh, rags and cloths to keep everything dry. If they did that, it typically didn't jam. So so Brad's next question was, uh, were the gunners responsible for cleaning their own guns after the mission was completed? Yes, absolutely. They they could, uh, <clears throat> they, they were, uh, you know, pretty much, that was like a, a third appendage to that gun that obviously their life could depend on it. So they were, they were taught to make sure that they didn't uh, allow the gun to jam up because it was dirty or wasn't cleaned properly. Scott, your question uh, seems to be answered by Greg, but we'll also get Colin to, to weigh in. Uh, Colin, uh, in your interviews with the Luftwaffe uh, pilots, did any of them ever com comment on firing at men in parachutes? Yes. General Gallon was approached by Herman Goering. Goering said, what do you think about our pilots uh, shooting these guys under parachutes? And Gallon said under Geneva 1929, that's a violation of the laws of war. And I will court martial the first man I, I know who does it. And then he was tested because Walter Dahl, commander of a JG-300 in 1944, had a pilot named Klaus Brettschneider, which we have a couple of a photograph of him and his Bockwolf Robouts. And uh, Brett Schneider went insane. His entire family was killed in a bombing raid. Every member of his family was killed. He lost his mind, and he would start picking off airmen in their parachutes. Walter Dahl, when I interviewed Dahl, he said he ran him for court-martial, grounded him. Gallon said, okay, I'll take the charge, and I'll run a court-martial on him. Goering overrode that and said, put him back in the air. We're killing, we're killing our enemies. We're not gentlemen. Hmm. Raw stuff. And by the okay, way, another... in, in that same conversation, that was when Heinrich Himmler gave the order to Galland that he wanted every single one of his wing leaders to submit every to surrender every black pilot that they shot down from the Americans, me, Tuskegee guys, to surrender them to the SS for proper dispensation. And Galland said, no way in hell. And Goering at least backed Galland up on that and said, no, they, they're property of the Luftwaffe. We're not going to do that. Hmm. Uh, also in the chat, did Heinz Bear shoot down the most four-engine bombers? How successful was the pressurized uh, BF-109H? Uh, a couple questions in, in this chat. Which which four-engine uh, bomber was shot down the most, B-17 or B-24? Um, we can maybe answer a couple of those before we answer the other ones. Yeah, the uh, Messerschmitt H, uh, all the Messerschmitt 109 models were not very effective in shooting down bombers for three reasons. One, they were liquid cooled and if they took a hit, they were going to seize up and the pilot had to get out. Second, they didn't have enough armor to protect against 50 calibers. A lot of pilots died in the cockpit. And the third reason why the 109s were not that effective was because they really could not handle the G force required to dive into a frontal attack. That's why most of your 109 pilots would, would stay with the rear attack. Your 190 pilots with an air cooled radial BMW engine uh, the 90, uh, the 801, they would uh, they would be able to operate not as well at high altitude as liquid cooled Messer Schmidt, but they they could take a lot more damage and they had a lot more armor and the the rotating engine was able to take more damage and still fly as opposed to the liquid cooled BMW. So, which of the four engine bombers was shot down the most, B seventeen or B twenty four? That I would have to research. I don't have the answer off the top of my head. And Heinz Bear was very successful at shooting down bombers and other aircraft. I believe his final tally was 238 victories during the war. And he shot down a few bombers. But Georg Peter Ader, who I interviewed, was the had the most confirmed bomber kills at 36 with another 24 unconfirmed. Did the 15th Air Force suffer as, signif as significant a loss of their B-17 and B-24s as the 8th Air Force? Eighth Air Force suffered the most of any of the Air Forces. But the 15th Air Force, who we, we will do a program on in a few weeks, and we did one a couple of years ago, but we'll focus on the 15th later. It was ever only about one third the size of the 8th Air Force, and it really didn't come online until the fall of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, let me think about the year here, until uh, uh, the early part of 1944 in Foggia, Italy, and really didn't become of great size until mid-44. So it just didn't have as many planes as the B-17 did. But those men suffered and fought just as bravely and under extreme conditions as the 8th Air Force did. They just didn't get as much news or attention as the 8th Air Force did. 
And if I could say one more thing, every single German pilot I interviewed who shot down bombers said they were astonished at the bravery that those men could go back into those aircraft after what they had had dealt them. They said no braver men ever ever lived. Uh, last question before the station break here uh, from Paul. In the series, they mentioned that the flat guns of the Germans were controlled by radar, but I thought only U.S. and Britain had radar. Incorrect. Uh, Joseph Cam Hoover uh, introduced uh, radar-guided uh, anti-aircraft guns in 1942 for the uh, night fighter force, for the uh, RAF uh, Bomber Command uh, night raids. But then they began u building more units, the Würzburg Gereta unit, for instance, that would uh, tie into the airborne controller radar systems for the night fighters. They used that along with uh, Botan and some of the others, uh, other systems. And those, those uh, 88s and 105s were radar guarded in many cases. And they also ran what was called the flak trains, which uh, the night, the night trains carried airborne radar as well, and they could also track uh, incoming formations and guide pilots and guns to the target. Thank you. We're going to take a quick station break here. I'm going to share my screen, and then I do have a, a little diagram that was also put into the chat that we can take a look at. Uh, but we do want to thank our sponsors uh, for this program, first being Tobacco-Free Adagio Health. Uh, they are dedicated to preventing and reducing tobacco use, educating people about tobacco hazards, and advocating for healthier places to live, work, and play. You can find out more there is to know about Tobacco Free Adagio Health on their website, tobaccofree.adagiohealth.org. Thank you so much, Tobacco Free, for uh, um, sponsoring tonight's program. We also want to thank UPMC for Life. Uh, they can help you make sense of Medicare, get the answers and information you need, such as how to choose the Medicare Advantage plan that's right for you. UPMC for Life has plans designed for veterans by veterans that can save you money and get you more benefits. You can view all plan options by going to upmchealthplan.com forward slash Medicare. Thank you so much, UPMC for Life. Uh, we also have the new magazine uh, just came out. I have my copy right here. So make sure that if you don't, if you don't, if you didn't receive this, uh, it's probably because we don't have your address. So please send us your address at Todd at veteransbreakfastclub.org. We will make sure to send this out to you. Again, this is a free quarterly magazine from the Veterans Breakfast Club, uh, packed to the gills, uh, cover to cover, um, with excellent veteran stories. We also have a survey that we like to uh, put into the chat here. It takes about two and a half minutes to complete. Um, we would love to hear your thoughts about tonight's program. We look at these very closely and we also like to know how we're doing a good job, if we're doing a good job, thoughts and questions and comments that you might have uh, or even suggestions for future VBC programs. Uh, so make sure you take a couple minutes to fill out the survey. I'll put that in the chat in just a minute. We also have our Lioness, the Origin Story podcast that you can check out on uh, the on any podcast audio uh, platform. Uh, so if you listen to podcasts, make sure you search for the Lioness, the Origin Story podcast about the women who served post 9-11 in combat prior to the combat exclusion policy being removed. We have a Vietnam Veterans Day event happening next week, March 29th, 6 to 8 p.m. at the Heinz History Center here in Pittsburgh. I will also put the link in the chat if you are not registered to join us that night. You can either do it in person or online. Every Vietnam veteran will receive a welcome home bag. And as for next Monday, our next program, uh, that'll be March 25th, 7 to 8.30. Uh, that says VBC Happy Hour, but we have changed the title of the Monday night programs to the Scuttlebutt. Uh, that we'll be reviewing our traveling to Vietnam. Uh, there was a trip that we took last year to Vietnam. Uh, we're going to be talking about that trip uh, and also uh, have an author on uh, that is joining us tonight. I, I seem to have uh, maybe forgot your name, sir. You, I know I saw you in the ch in the room here. Uh, Jerry Augustine, you're going to be joining us, correct, to talk about your book? Yes. Excellent. Looking forward to that. Um, so thank you, uh, Glenn. I will hand this back over to you in just a second, because I did have in the chat, someone put um, this diagram, which I thought I'd bring up for everybody to take a look at. Ah, very nice. Mm -hmm. It gives a bit of, a bit more of an understanding of the box formation. Who put that up? Uh, Steve Snyder, I believe. Ah, Steve. Thank you, Steve. I didn't see you on uh, this evening. This evening, I know you you were going to be. Steve is uh, one of our sort of panel of experts that we've had and author of a great book called Shot Down about his father. And we had Steve on, oh, a month or so ago. Thank you, Steve. That was very, very interesting. And right, back to you, Glenn. Okay. 
Let me uh, share my screen again. And we'll take this home. Okay. We seeing this okay? So we'll come back to Joe. Joe, uh, this this uh, low ball turret gunner. So just by the way, I spoke with a man named Les Schrenk, if I have the right pronunciation today, 100 years old, ball turret gunner, NPOW. And he's going to be our uh, my interview for the next program we do. Uh, and uh, I've got a long conversation coming up with him later uh, next week, actually, in preparation for that program. Interesting, interesting man. So, Joe? Typically, um, the pilot selected uh, the gun stations for his crew. All the gunners were cross-trained that they could do uh, different stations. My dad was a flight engineer, so he was automatically selected to be the top turret gunner because he had to be right behind the pilot and co-pilot and fire flares or uh, work on circuits that, uh, you know, toggle circuit breakers and whatnot. So typically the shortest crewman was in the, in the ball turret. There were some exceptions. This picture shows... Um, incoming uh, fighter planes, but it also shows uh, the yellow tip propeller. So the top and lower ball turret had lockouts, so you wouldn't shoot off part of your plane. And on the top turret, you, you could not shoot off your vertical stabilizer. If you were going, if there was a bandits coming in at six o'clock level, you couldn't shoot off the stabilizer if you rotated your gun all the way to the back and it's the same for this. Um, the uh, propeller could actually get in the path of the guns and it would lock out. You couldn't come up uh, totally uh, close to the fuselage. This also had the Sperry gun sight. So again, you could just focus on getting those planes in your uh, optical crosshair and, and then work on leading, uh, not leading, but tracking the fighters as they went by. <laughs> Well, there must have been instances of of our gunners shooting our B seventeens in the for formations next to them. Is it's that the research I I've seen? It's less than actually two percent. I've seen wow. anywhere from one and a half to two percent, which is amazing, given that we just showed how tightly packed those formations were. But in again, in gunnery school, they said you not you know shoot your. Um, uh, your uh, fellow buddy down right next to you. Uh, that's the the cones, the slide we have put up yeah. with the cones. You yeah. focused on where the cone of fire was, but he also had to visualize where that formation uh, plane was next to you. So that you had even potentially even a narrower cone because yeah. you wouldn't just rotate, like the top turn wouldn't rotate and fire into uh, other planes in formation. So you just stuck to that na even narrowed cone if you did see a fighter. By the way, just so to back up what he said, Curtis LeMay factored in friendly fire when he created the box formation. Okay. Okay. So uh, what are we looking at here, Colin? Okay, this is Keith Ferris's painting, uh, which is the big mural is in the Air and Space Museum in the Smithsonian. I spoke to Keith about this about 30 years ago. This is Klaus Brettschneider in his FW-190 A8 Rabouts. Rabouts was his nickname given to him by his uh, Bahio Herrmann, who was a friend of mine. He was a, the first Commodore and creator of JG-300, the wild boar. Rabouts means brawler in German, basically bar fighter. And that's what Black Schneider did. This is the Schweinfurt Regensburg 43 raid, August 43, where Brett Schneider would, his, he favored the rear attack. He loved it. Brett Schneider would go to shoot down. That, I think the one on the, on the far left, the B-17 is called Bonnie B. Anyway, he would shoot down two B-17s, and then out of ammunition, he rammed the third to bring it down, then bailed out of his wreckage, survived, and then flew the next day. But he but he preferred the rear attack method uh, as opposed to the frontal assault. This was Bright Schneider again in his red one. He would get above the formation and then he would dive and then he would come up from beneath and then he would start whacking away at the engines. 
His first shots would be at the turret gunner, the ball turret, and the tail to kill them, and then he would focus upon the wing roots, which was the primary focal point of trying to shear the wing away. It worked great on B-24s, but not so much on B-17s. Did, did the Germans have <clears throat> slightly different tactics for the 24 versus the 17? Yes. Uh, the B-24, they would focus on the wing route. It was the weakest point. Uh, Gore Gator found that out when he shot down about two or three in one mission. Uh, he found that the wing route with 20 millimeters would shear away. It was a great kill. Uh, the B-17 was more rugged in that respect from the German perspective. So they would focus upon the uh, the nose and the cockpit. Yeah. Now, this is the FW-190 Dora 9 that came online in 1944. It was not as heavily armed as the uh, one, the 190 you saw Brett Schneider flying with 420-millimeter cannons and, and two 13.7-millimeter machine guns. This 190 Dora 9 was basically built to to, cha to take on the P-51 Mustang, because it, and it was very effective. In fact, the guys who flew it, like Eric Brown after the war, said it was the equal to the Mustang in every aspect except range. Hmm. Now let's, let's, let's ask our uh, two veterans, uh, our two fighter pilots, uh, Joe or Ed, did you ever see this plane in the air? Have any encounters with it? Ed, I've asked you to unmute. Ed, we can't hear you. We just have to have you unmute. Yeah, there you go, Ed. Once you're on mute, we should be able to hear you. Hi. I never had any actual combat, but I saw the FW-9-190 in the air a lot, a lot of times. Okay. When we were strafing, the FW-9-190 would come in over us, but I never actually got into a combat with the one. Air-to-air -air combat with them. Yeah. yeah. But I saw a lot of them because... Uh, they they were more prevalent than the 109. The 109, I think, spent more time after the bombers at the beginning of the war, and then eventually the one the folk was more stable and and less likely to get shot down because of the type of engine. Jo Joe, uh, if you're still, is Joe still on the call? He is. I'll ask you, Joe, if you could unmute. We see you wave, Joe. If uh, if you have anything to add, if you want to unmute, we can uh, we can have you. There you go. Yeah, uh, I uh, did encounter uh, one ninety on the. Uh, I think it was my twelfth mission. Uh, we had a a large force of. Uh, 109s and 190s uh, hit hit the bombers, and uh, the, the end results were about 11 bombers down, and we, uh, our group, uh, destroyed uh, 19 and a half. But I had a head-on with one, and we just played chicken. Yeah. I could see his uh, cannon fire, and I'm sure he could see my 50s, but we uh, didn't do any significant damage, and we I passed underneath them at about... Uh, well, probably a hundred feet, and uh, my uh, flight leader was on his tail, and uh, as I passed under, I mean, he didn't want to fire because he could have hit me with with the, the head on. So as I passed under, uh, he zapped him, and uh, so we could, we did. Uh, he did get the the uh, the one ninety. I think we had, <clears throat> saw that beautiful print of that event uh, last week when we had you on. So. Yeah. Bob, Bob Flage has your hand up. Yes, sir. I have two questions. Uh, when Colin mentioned the German fighter was out of ammunition, he rammed the bomber. What year was that? That was 1944. That was the okay, mission. The, this is about when the uh, Sonderkommando Elbe? Yes, yeah, Sonderkommando oh. Elbe was formed, but he was not part of the Sonderkommando Elbe. He was just a nut. <laughs> but that the they were back in, what, 45? Yeah, they, yeah, Hyo Herman created that in uh, February of 45. It went operational around uh, April 45, and that was that was really just desperation. Was that because of uh, less experienced pilots, loss of ammunition, or 
Um, uh, less experienced pilots. You have to understand, by 1939, when the war started, the average German pilot had about 400 hours of flight training time, about comparable to an American or British pilot. By 1945, the average German pilot was 18 years old and had about 20 hours of actual flight uh, experience. Okay. So they wow. figured the best thing to do is just strip out the armor, load it with ammo, and then load it with fuel, and have the guy shoot his ammo off, and then just try to bail out before yeah, and guide his aircraft into a collision. I, I, so how I effective was that? It's almost the sort of German kamikaze, you know, mentality. Absolutely. In fact, the, the kamikaze uh, effect was what was motivating uh, Goering to actually talk to Hayo. And Hayo told me this personally. He said, I sat there in a meeting with the Goering and, and the Fuhrer, and they said, what about us ramming these bombers? And Hayo and, and Goering said, I like the idea. And Hayo said, well, I do too, but I don't think the pilots will be too enthusiastic about it. <laughs> well, have a follow-up question here in the chat. Uh, can you talk about the 17 April 1945 ramming attack by Sonder Command Commando Elbe? Sound of Commando Elba. Yeah, that was a big one. That was where, well, one of my one of my uh, interviews, uh, Han Samaya, uh, actually survived that flying a 109 strip down to 109 G10, or no, no, my mistake, 109 G16. He uh, they stripped all the armor out of it, and he actually survived ramming into the uh, vertical stabilizer, ripping the tail section off of a B17. And uh, but yeah, that was that was that was probably the most successful single mission for the Santa Commando Elba. But it, it it didn't make any difference. I mean, it wasn't going to change the out outcome of the war. Do we know how many how many bombers we lost due to that tactic? I don't have those figures in front of me. No, I mean, I I, I have no idea. Let me uh, uh, go on here. We just have a few minutes left. I'm going to skip some of the slides, guys, that we had prepared because. As always, so this is the uh, 262 that came along uh, uh, in uh, what mid 44, uh, Colin. Uh, yeah, ju the, yeah, June 44, it, it went operational, scored the first kill in July of 44. And this ought to be familiar to Joe Peter Burrs because I stole it from his slide deck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, what? Well, well, if that 262 had come online 12 months earlier, 18 months earlier, what do you think would have happened? What would have, well, how would it have changed the air war? It wouldn't. Uh, well, go ahead, Thomas. <laughs> it, it would not change the course of the air war. And for, for three reasons. First of all, the 262, the, the engine life of a UMO 004 was about eight to nine hours, 12 hours on a good day. And second of all, the Germans did not have the raw materials to keep manufacturing the engine components. They couldn't get manganese. They couldn't get cobalt. And our production facilities in the U.S. outstripped everything known to mankind. There was nothing that the Germans could do to outproduce pilots, outproduce material, machinery. And, for, and, and on top of that, a lot of the German pilots, as they learned of the Holocaust by 44, 45, began, began, they, they, they became disillusioned with their leadership. They... They flew for their country and for their people, but they, their heart wasn't in it. Our heart was in it the whole time. Very well put, Colin. Great answer. Um, I, I'm going to uh, kind of jump a couple of things here. I, I'd like to get to the last couple of uh, slides of for for Joe's father. Uh, Joe, it, it, tell us about the landing gear problem and then what your father had to do with the bombs. Sure. So on one of the missions, um, when they encountered flak, they're um, they're coming uh, across the channel ready to land, and the pilot radios my dad that the landing gear uh, is stuck up, and to hand crank it down. So my dad radioed the co-pilot, and these switches are on the co-pilot side. By the way, just an aside that. Um, landing gear up down is right next to the flap switch and some of the pilots were crashing their planes because they hit the wrong switch when they were putting the landing gear up and down the lower flap suddenly but anyway he he radioed make sure you have that switch uh on the up position and then he started to crank it well the co-pilot didn't hear him whatever he left it in the down position as soon as he turned to crank it spun like a fan and was hitting against his hand and shoulder when they landed, he had some choice words for his co-pilot. He cussed them out, <laughs> and that co-pilot walked away. He never said a word. <laughs> and then, uh, 
tell us about this. What this was a souvenir. Yeah, yeah. this is uh, what I had from uh, Dad's souvenir box. This is a oxygen gauge from a fighter plane, German fighter plane. And Dad said he got this from a, a prisoner of war. Well, I learned that Dad flew in the uh, revival missions that um, uh, liberated, rescued the flyers in um, in Barth. He also flew in Linz, which was another prisoner of war camp near uh, Malthausen. And so back at Barth, the prisoner of wars could scavenge through uh, German fighters that were sabotaged on the runway. And they, one of the uh, prisoner of wars had this gauge that he gave to my dad. He, my dad also picked up, if you can believe this, uh, an entire belt of 13 millimeter German machine gun bullets, which he brought home. I don't know how he did it, but when I opened the case, I'm pulling out a whole belt of uh, these 13 millimeter, which is similar to 50 calibers. And he brought that home with him too. This is dad um, in aviation cadet training, um, steerman uh, plane type stuff. Again, washed out with thousands, tens of thousands of uh, uh, prospective pilots, but luckily became a flight engineer so he could land the plane if necessary. Well, Joe, I, we didn't get to every single slide, but uh, really thank you for the work you did here to tell your father's story and to really dig into the details of how uh, the gunners, you know, tried to protect the uh, the B-17s and B-24s. Pretty much the same story for the 24s, I'm sure. Uh, great uh, to have you on, Joe, and great to have you tell this story. Oh, thank you. I wish I he was here like Ed. Uh, and Joe to tell it firsthand. I did my best to try to speak on his behalf. I miss him every day, but I'm glad I had a chance to tell the story. And Colin, you know, your your, your ability to tell the story from the other point of view is just fascinating. Uh, I think it's easy to, to uh, I don't know, think of our enemies in nothing but negative light, but the stories of those men on the other side uh, is as compelling as well. Well, I interviewed over 400 veterans of over 100 fighter pilots, Luftwaffe fighter pilots, and I went to the German Gemeinschaft der Jagdflieger reunions every year for many years, and 16 nations were represented. Many American fighter pilots came in, and one of the, the, the first thing that they would say is, my, my, my brother, pilot, whether it was a Belgian, Frenchman, Russian, or, or, or an American, uh, there was no animosity. There was total respect across the board from all all the guys, and and I was very privileged to have been made an honorary member, and uh, and I'm and I'm so privileged to know that Lucky Luckadoo and Ed Cottrell and Joe Peter Burst are still alive because they represent the best this country has ever produced, and they are the finest Americans that I know. Well, Colin, did you interview or the the German pilot that escorted? the B-17 home. These yes. Two guys, they got yes. together in California after afterwards, but did you meet him? Yes, I knew Franz Stigler and his wife, Haya. I knew Franz very well. He flew with a pilot named Hans Joachim Marseille, who was a subject of my book, The Star of Africa. The second edition of that book is coming out later this year. We're working on a 10-part series on his story. Uh, yes, I knew Franz very well. When Adam Akos wrote the book, A Higher Call, he knew that I knew all the Germans and he contacted me many years ago. I became his mentor and I guided him with the book. In fact, 25% of the book is from my interviews, but, uh, I gave it to him free of charge. And I said, you're writing an important story. And I never met, uh, Charlie Brown, the bomber pilot, but right. he knew Charlie quite well. And, uh, but yeah, that was, uh, that was a, and I knew Franz for years, many years. Right. See, Dave, somehow... Sorry, Dave, yeah, see, raise your hand up. We'll go with the last question, Dave. Yeah, just a quick question for Colin, because you talk about Adolf Galland a lot. Um, I recall hearing something about him being a cigar smoker, and he actually had a lighter installed in his aircraft. He did. In fact, his wingman, Gerhard Schopfel, and I have a photo that they may not show tonight that I sent to uh, Glenn, but uh, Gerhard Schopfel was there the day they installed the, cig the cigar lighter for him. And uh, I asked Gallon about that cigar lighter, and he said, yeah, they also put a special holder in, in, in the cockpit next to my landing gear so that I could just set my cigar into a, into the holder while I was in combat and I wasn't on oxygen. I could smoke it again. 
<laughs> and well, Gallon gave me a cigar when I was at his house interviewing him. Over. <laughs> Well, I think we need to wrap it up here, Sean. Oh, yes, we do. Paul, uh, you did remind me in the chat. Uh, if Germany had radar, how did they get it? That was a follow-up to his earlier question. The The Germans were already developing radar. They just didn't have the synchronization locked on. The British were about two years ahead of them. The, Brit the British had radar in 38. It was effectively operational in 39. They used it effectively during the Battle of Britain. The, the Germans uh, managed to get the, uh, the narrow bandwidth required, and by 40... One, the Germans had radar by 42. They integrated that into not only the anti-aircraft fire, but they put onboard radar into their night fighters that was uh, correlated and in integrated into the ground radar system. So uh, it, 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 the Americans, we were developing it too, but the British were ahead of us, so they gave us the technology, but the Germans were right behind them. Yeah. yeah. All right, Glenn. Well, <clears throat> thanks again for everybody, Colin and Joe. Fantastic uh, work and in-depth knowledge is so impressive. Thank you so very much for helping put this on tonight. Well, actually, for putting it on tonight, allowing me to just uh, guide along the conversation. Uh, I just wanted to make sure everybody knows next week, next Thursday, March 28th, we are not going to have a Masters of the Air show. The following night, Friday night, is our Vietnam Veterans Day uh, event and celebration and just resources are a bit limited. So no program on the 28th. The next program will be April the 4th when we'll be interviewing uh, veteran Les Shrink. So uh, please don't uh, forget to tune in April 4th. We'll be reminding you as often as we can. Definitely through email. And for everyone, thank you again, uh, Ed, Joe, uh, everyone joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you for all of the lively chat and questions there. Join us Monday night. Uh, we'll be talking about our Vietnam veterans trip. Looking forward to seeing you all again. Uh, thank you, uh, Colin and Joe, uh, also for joining us for the conversation. You guys have a great night. Thanks, everybody. Good night.